morning and light. Welcome to Life Point Worship online this morning. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I feel like a Minnesota native this morning when I got up and uh, prepared myself to walk out the front door um, and then walked out the front door and wished that I were dead. Um, just like one of you. <laughs> no, no, no. All joking aside, we are uh, very glad that the Lord has given us the gift of, um, of being able to do what we're doing this morning and uh, being able to uh, allow all of you to stay safe, um, uh, spread all around the Twin Cities and not venture out this morning, uh, but still allow us to be here and to worship together um, all across the metro area. Um, if you're with us this morning and you have children, we are excited to let you know um, we have Children's Church online this morning. Even though Miss Molly is not in uh, another room of our building as she normally is on Sunday mornings, uh, she is at home online on Children's Church right now. And so if you've got an extra an extra online device or digital device, and you uh, can go to YouTube and find our description box and click on the link to Online Children's Church, then your children can have their own thing this morning in another room, and you can worship uh, with us here, <coughs> here on, this, um, uh, on, this, on, on this video um, live this morning. Um, uh, also, if you're with us online, um, maybe you're one of those that have... Uh, haven't yet really come back after COVID-19. Uh, and maybe you're new this morning. The description box in your YouTube video feed has lots of links to help you be a part of the body this week. We've got links to our giving page. We've got links to our website. We've got links to our, um, our, our Facebook group where we uh, share prayer requests and share videos and share encouraging thoughts um, and share uh, and share share news updates and and whatnot. And so um, take advantage of that this week. Uh, this morning we're on our second week of a three week series that we're calling Satan's Sex Ed, uh, in which we're looking at lies that Satan tells us as it relates to this uh, this sex area of our lives. Now last week we looked at a lie that Satan tells all of us. Um, the lie that our lives, that all of this is really actually about us. Coming out of that, uh, next week we're actually going to look at uh, lies that Satan is telling our married adults. But this week on Valentine's Day, gentlemen, I hope you didn't forget. Women, I'm sure you didn't forget. I don't, I don't know how that works, but um, uh, this morning we're actually looking at lies that Satan is telling our single adults. Now, if you're a married adult with us, this is for you as well, not just um, off in the abstract, but you're going to find it very, very easy to connect with this. Uh, but we did want to take just, um, just, just a week and speak directly to our single adults and, and talk about uh, some of the, um, the issues and the lies that, uh, that Satan is whispering into the ears of our single, single adults. And this morning we'll be starting off here in just a few minutes uh, discussing the question, how far is too far? Woo! It's going to be an interesting discussion. But just a few minutes ago we shared that um, uh, <coughs> we do have children's church. <laughs> if this discussion of how far is too far is something that maybe you don't want your children in the room for, or you're just not sure, then just plug them into children's church and engage with us this morning. And then if you want to go back and watch it with your children or your preteens, then you have that option. But as we turn our hearts to Jesus this morning, because even regardless of what we're talking about here, our goal is always to point to Jesus, to point uh, ourselves and to orient our hearts toward Jesus. And so as we begin to do that this morning, uh, we want to acknowledge those areas in our lives where we tend to look everywhere but to him for that abundant life that Jesus promises, for that, that, uh, that satisfaction, that contentment. And so as we, as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we want to pray for those who um, are in need of our intercession, but we also want to begin to, to recognize that there are all kinds of things that, uh, all kinds of ways that we look for uh, the good in life in places other than Jesus. And we want to just go ahead and tell Jesus, this morning, Lord, if I'm doing that in an area that I don't recognize, go ahead and illuminate that for me. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, there are so many um, in, our, in our life point family, in our body, who are, um, who are in particular need this morning. Um, with regard to health issues, we think of, of people like Virginia Sweeney, of people like Marv Floden, of Jan Sorrow, of Paul Ripley, of Ron Johnson, of Rose Holmberg, of Larry Atkins, and, and so many others. Lord, above and beyond coronavirus, there are so many of us who are um, dealing with health issues. And so, Lord, we ask for healing, we ask for patience, we ask for grace, we ask for a lack of pain. We ask for you to show us how we can surround each other and um, be good family particularly on this Valentine's Day weekend. Lord, for our Corinne family, uh, we want to pray a a particular prayer um, of your grace and your mercy. Lord, of those who are in Myanmar struggling in the midst of civil war and coup, um, for those those Christians who are literally fleeing their homes and fleeing their communities uh, for fear of their their own life and the lives of their families, Lord, we we ask that you would be ever-present. Lord, for those um, here in our, in our TKBC community or in our uh, metro community, Lord, that, um, that know those who are in me and are, that may, maybe still have family, still have friends, um, Lord, that they would uh, feel your presence, that they would know your grace. And Lord, for us this morning, as we begin to open up ourselves to to what it is that you have to say to us this morning to show us this morning may we prepare our hearts and prepare our minds to hear whatever it is you have to say Lord as we begin this morning let us praise you um, for all that is good and wonderful about you We pray according to your identity and your character. Amen. Please join us in singing praise to God. Thank you. 
Let's read from Psalm 103, verses 8 to 13. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Oh 
parents to use your discretion in regards to the next part of our service and the content therein. Children are encouraged to go to the online link that is in the description box if you want them to attend Children's Church. Thank you. What's up, Satan? So, talking sex. I'm ready. Uh, so you for oral sex? Definitely for oral sex. Definitely. Wait, but is oral sex sex? Uh, it's not sex. Uh, I plead the fifth. If you're living uh, in today's age and and you're not okay with oral sex, uh, you you know the 90s have called. It's what you do. You you get dinner. You have a movie. Uh, oral sex. You go home at night. That's I mean that's it's part of the dating process. I mean. Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me? Uh, will premarital sex help your dating relationship? I, I definitely, I'd say, you know, you got to get after that early. You got to start early. Will, uh, will living together help you prepare for marriage? You know, here's the deal. You know, you wouldn't buy a car without going out and put some miles on it. And uh, I mean, how, how, how could you marry someone if you don't even know what it's going to be like? I mean, you've got to try that out. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, what do you think about pornography? The, the biggest problem with pornography in my mind is that kids today don't realize how hard it used to be to get pornography. You used to have to work to get that stuff. You actually had to go to the store. Is this, uh, is this decaf or? What about masturbation? Uh, masturbation, definitely for it. Uh, I'll tell you what, I gotta give it up. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't create things, but I gotta thank God for masturbation. L let me tell you something about masturbation. Number one, masturbation's never hurt anybody, all right? And number two, Masturbation's awesome. I don't do it though, personally. What about adultery? Do you really want to be locked down with one person? There's how many, what, like six billion people in the world? I mean, that might be what your grandparents thought. We're in a different generation, baby. I've done lots of great things for you. Uh, cats and the plague. So. What about uh, homosexuality? If a guy wants to be with another guy, Hey, props to him. More chicks for the rest of us. Am I right? Huh? He knows what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't have a problem with it personally. I mean, you like diet soda, I don't. You know? You know what I'm saying? How far is too far? When it comes to... Uh, to sex as a single adult who is also a follower of Jesus, that is the question. Well, that and maybe how do I know if she's the one? But that's for a different, that's for a different day. No, now we are running on the assumption that there is a too far, but this question of how far can I go in the realm of physical intimacy with my significant other who isn't my spouse and still be on the okay side of things? Now, media and culture tell me that, that everything's okay so long as I'm ready for it, so long as I'm mature enough to handle it. Um, think about every family uh, television special. Think about what every family telev television special tells us when the teenage main character is thinking about having sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend. What is it that the best friend always responds? That's a big step. Yeah, but, you know, I really think that we're ready for it. You know, I mean, we've been dating for like three whole weekends. But then by the end of the episode, the main character always decides, well, maybe I'm not really ready for it. Maybe, maybe we just need to wait. Or uh, what about the main character who tells his friend, uh, you know, I'm going to ask her to move in with me. What's the classic response? Wow, man, that's a big step. It's a big step. Yeah, but... You know, she's really, she's really looking for a commitment here. And uh, I mean, what sets commitment more than uh, I'm expecting sex every night? Am I right? Now, the school system tells, uh, tells our teenagers, do whatever physical intimacy you want, just do it responsibly. Now, by responsibly, they're not, mean, they're not meaning emotionally responsible or uh, spiritually responsible. Uh, the school system is saying, do whatever you want, just don't get the clap and don't get pregnant. Culture tells young women, do whatever you want, but then don't tell anyone because that makes you a slut. 
Culture tells young men, do whatever you want and then tell everyone because that makes you a man. But what about Jesus? What does Jesus say about this question? To take a look at that, let's play a little game, all right? Now, live from Maplewood, Minnesota. Is it okay? America's most awkward game where we look at all the things that you want to do with your boyfriend and girlfriend, but don't want to admit that you want to do with your boyfriend and girlfriend and ask, is it okay? Now, let's start with something easy. Great job, guys. Thank you. Let's start with something easy. How about holding hands? Is it okay? I mean, I'm not the authority here, but sure, let's say it's okay, right? Sure, of course. Obviously, it's okay. What about, what about interdigitation, right? So like this kind of number, right? So it's not just like the simple holding hands anymore. It's like we want to be so close that we want all of our fingers to be touching all of our other fingers. Is that okay? Eh, sure, sure. The audience says sure. What about, ooh, I, what about this one? What about the standing spoon? You know, when you're like, not when you're laying down and spooning, but when you're standing up and he's got his arms wrapped around her and they're all interdigitating and, and uh, he's just all snuggled up to her and, and she's just, just, snuggle, oh, just snuggling into his chest. You know, you, you know exactly what we're talking about here. Is the standing spoon okay? I don't know. What about, what about a peck on the cheek? Peck on the cheek. I mean, you can do that with your, your aunt. Surely you can do that, do that with your girlfriend, right? Oh, what about tongue? Oh, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that one for the moment. Let's, let's go to the opposite side of the spectrum. Okay, so we read in the scriptures that God made sex to be between a man and a woman, uh, specifically within covenantal marriage. But what really counts as sex? Okay, so, so vaginal sex. All right, that's a, uh, so that's an easy one. Vaginal sex, yeah, that's, that's in the not okay category, absolutely. But what about oral sex? I mean, you don't even really have to see each other naked to have oral sex. I mean, there are segments of our culture in which if you're not having oral sex by the third date, this relationship probably isn't really headed anywhere. You're probably headed to the friend zone. Ah, let's leave that to the side for the moment. Let's save that one. What about, what about pornography? I mean, you know, I mean, the industry is going to make it whether you consume it or not, right? I mean, you're just looking, Right? Uh, let's let's set pornography to the side as well. Masturbation. Oh, if oh, if there was ever an easy answer, right? I mean, you're totally by yourself. Uh, you're just I mean, you're just imagining having sex with someone fully in your mind. How can that possibly be wrong? And yet, who's willing to write masturbation on the OK column? Anybody willing to write on, to, to 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 be that person? Oh, let's let's take a step back. And ask the question again, what, is, what does Jesus have to say about any of this? Well, as we're going to see in just a few minutes, it actually turns out that what Jesus has to say about all of this, is that, uh, about this question of how far is too far, is that there is no right answer to this question. But not because everything's relative. Not because everything is okay under certain circumstances. What Jesus has to say about this is actually that this is a really bad question. It's, it's just the, the whole question is the wrong question. Because even asking this question betrays the perspective that we think that somewhere out here there is this, um, there's this line that God has drawn. Um, and, and what's on the other side of the line is wonderful and fun and good. Um, but somewhere there's this invisible line, and, um, and we're not really sure why God drew it. Maybe it's just a test. Maybe to test us. You know, we're not really sure, whatever. Um, but if we cross the line, then we've done wrong. Then we've sinned. 
And yet in reality, what I really want is all the stuff on the other side of that line. I, but, but I don't want to be bad. Um, and so I want to find the line and I, and I want to be as close as humanly possible to the line without actually crossing it. Um, now, sometimes I hear people say, no, no, that's, that's actually not true. I don't, I don't want to be, I, I don't want all of that over there uh, because I believe that what God says is sin is toxic and, uh, and, and, and dangerous for me. And so I, I want to know where the line is um, so that I can just make sure that I'm not across it. And if we tell ourselves that, but we still go hunting for the line, well, then we're lying to ourselves. <laughs> because if we really thought that everything on this side of the line was good and wonderful, and everything on that side of the line was toxic and terrible, well, why not just say, I'm going to try and stay as far away from the line as possible? Why not just say, you know what, I'm going to save all this physical intimacy stuff for after I get married. And there are those that, there are those that say that. There are books written about that. Um, but, but I'm going to save all of this till after I'm married, and I'm going to draw my own personal line much more conservatively than I think is probably actually necessary. Why not take that route? And yet no one ever wants, seems to want to take that approach. Because again, regardless of what I say to you or say to myself, the reality is that I really want, where I really want is to be way over there. But even, maybe even more than wanting to be way over there, um, I want to feel like I'm staying within the bounds. And so my answer is to go as far as I can possibly go and still make sure that I'm on this side of the line, that I'm on the right side of the line, so that when I'm hanging out with my Christian friends and someone mentions being sexually active, I can say, oh, no, 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 we're not having sex. I mean, yeah, we've seen each other completely naked, and we've touched most everything there is to touch. And, uh, you know, we make each other orgasm at least weekly. And I've got topless photos of her on my phone, but, 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 but we're not having sex. And that gives me some sense of pride. And I feel like I've won, like I've beat the system. Because we're basically having sex, but we're not technically having sex. And so we can still call ourselves virgins. And we're, uh, uh, I mean, we still wear our purity rings. And we can scoff at all our friends that have their pregnancy scares. And we can pretend that somehow we're better than they are because we're just having almost sex. And it's all because we think that what's going on is that this is us. And this, uh, this is the fence of rules that God puts up, uh, maybe to test our commitment to him or whatever. And out there, out here is all what's wonderful in the world. And then along comes Jesus and he says, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly and if that's the case, then we would expect him to let up on some of the rules or maybe even do away with them entirely. But actually what happens is exactly the opposite. He says, you have heard it said, but I tell you. And Jesus proceeds to tighten up rule after rule after rule. Jesus says, uh, you've heard it said, don't kill your brother, but I tell you, anyone who hates his brother might as well have killed him. Jesus says, you've heard it said that you can't leave your wife and run off with your girlfriend and expect her to be waiting for you when you decide to stop being a worthless sack of crap and come home. Now, that's my own paraphrase of Deuteronomy 24. But it's in there. It's verse 1. You want to look it up. But I tell you, this is Jesus, but I tell you, you don't get to leave your wife unless, she, unless she's cheated on you or abandoned the family. Jesus says, you've heard it said that you can't go have vaginal sex with people you meet on Tinder. But I tell you that pretending to have sex with someone in your mind, you might as well have crawled in the back of the car and done whatever it is that you are imagining yourself doing. What in the world? How can Jesus say, I came that you may have life more abundantly and then proceed to pull us even farther away from all the things that make life good? <clears throat> Because we have it backwards. Out there is not where all the wonderful good fun is. 
It's where death is. The abundant life isn't found in all that the world offers. It's found in Jesus. And that fence of rules, that's not to test us, to keep us from having the best time we might be able to. Those rules are to protect us and to serve us as indicators of, oops, I wasn't paying attention and I'm about to screw up my life. The Apostle Paul explains it this way. He writes in Galatians chapter 4, he says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. That word guardian is the Greek term paedagogos, and it referred to a slave who was tasked with leading the younger children to and from school. Now, this role absolutely did have certain implications of teaching worked into it because part of that role was also teaching children how to behave in public. But the role's primary function was not that of a teacher or that of a schoolmaster. It was that of a bodyguard to protect these children and make sure that they stayed safe. And here Paul describes the law, that fence of rules, as our paedagogos, that which protected us until Jesus came. And what was it that changed when Jesus came? Well, actually, that's one of the things we're going to talk about in just a few minutes when we look at Genesis chapter 3. But first, as our worship team begins to play, let's take a minute and seriously ask ourselves the question, where in my life have I fallen for the lie that the real, true, good life is found out there somewhere? And as a result, I find myself hunting for the line and trying to get as close to the line as possible and still be able to claim that I'm on the right side of it. Again, maybe for you this morning, uh, the thing that pops into your mind is sex. Maybe you're fighting a battle with pornography this morning and, and you keep going back and forth between thinking that pornography or maybe, maybe even just masturbation without pornography is on th this side of the line or on that side of the line. And if you are fighting that battle this morning, let me encourage you that you are not alone in fighting that battle. Eight out of ten men in the American church are, are engaged in that battle right alongside of you. But maybe, uh, maybe what comes to your mind isn't sex this morning. Maybe it's just flirting. Maybe it's just flirting. Maybe, uh, you know, I mean, where's the line really when it comes to flirtatiousness in the workplace or flirtatiousness on Facebook? I mean, we're not doing anything. And it's been years since that lug who calls himself my husband ever told me I'm pretty except when he's hoping for a happy ending. Maybe for you this morning, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with romance or sex. Maybe it's financial integrity as we get closer and closer to uh, tax day. Thank you. I mean, what really constitutes lying on your taxes? What is it in your life this morning where you've been looking for the good out there? So you find yourself in this constant internal negotiation of, is this still okay? We're going to take just a moment and we're going to pray. And we're going to ask God to reveal to us what it is in our life this morning that we're looking for out there. And then we're going to sing and we're going to ask God to make our hearts new so that we could pursue him in the ways that he's designed us to pursue him. So that we can move from unbelief to belief in every area of life. And then we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 3, and we're going, to see, um, we're going to see how this lie that the good life is out there, this is not only the lie that Satan is telling our singles, or even our married adults. This is also the very first lie that Satan ever told mankind. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for being one who illuminates. We praise you for being one who satisfies. And yet we admit 
and we ask your forgiveness for the fact that we are not, we do not always look to you to satisfy. And so Lord, this moment right now, even as I pray, Lord, even as we pray together, show uh, in each one of us, whether we're here at 2220 Edgerton or whether we're spread across the metro area or whether we're spread across the United States or spread around the world, Lord, right now in this moment, show us what it is inside of us, what desire, what need within us, we're looking to fill with all of that out there. And so we're constantly pushing the line and we're constantly pushing the line and we're constantly asking, am I still okay? Because what I really want is all that out there. And I don't want to trust you. Lord, even as you reveal it to us. Right on the tail of that revelation, Lord, um, bring your grace as well. And remind us that you don't, um, you don't shower us with blessings because we deserve them. You shower us with blessings because we belong to you. And that sin in our lives, you've already forgiven it. And yet as we move over and look at Genesis 3 this morning, at the, the way that Satan dealt with, um, with man and woman, may we begin to recognize that that's how Satan deals with us too. So that maybe the next time that he lies, we don't believe him. In your name we pray. Amen. Please join us. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. If you've got a Bible, um, if you've got a Bible, I think we're in the New Revised Standard Version. Um, I didn't mark it on my sheet, but I'm, I'm pretty sure we're in the NRSV. Uh, we are going to jump around just a little bit as we get to uh, the first part of Genesis chapter 3, but, 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 but we'll, we'll mark it. Uh, we start, starting out in verse 8 of Genesis chapter 2. And Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, Yahweh God made to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now in verse 15, Yahweh God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the man, you may freely eat of any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now looking at 3 verse 1. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you won't die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. <coughs> and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Now, the first three chapters of Genesis are one of those passages in the Old Testament where it's critically important that we understand the story being told and why that story was being told. Now, when you're talking about something like the creation of the universe and the first few hundred years of the history of mankind, you just can't tell the whole story. I mean, you can't tell it at all, much less in 12 chapters or 15 to 20 pages of the book of Genesis. I mean, it's, it's just an, it's an insane idea that you can tell, the, that everything worth telling can be told about that story. And so you have to decide which stories you're going to tell and which details you're going to include. And the thing that's going to determine how you answer those questions is the question of why you are telling the story at all. Let's take the story of Christopher Columbus, for example. Now, if we only had one meme to tell this story, we might go with, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <clears throat> or we might go with, hey, let's celebrate Columbus Day by breaking into someone's house and telling them we live there now. Now, both of these are relatively legitimate summaries of the story. Both are catchy, both are easy to remember, but they tell different angles of the story and include different details. Now, if we wanted to illustrate the courage of the European explorers, then we might include the dangers that Columbus' crew faced crossing the Atlantic. If we wanted to illustrate the barbarism of the European explorers, we might include that uh, within 20 years, 200,000 natives died at the hands of the Europeans. If we wanted to illustrate that those natives were just as barbaric as the Europeans who conquered them, then we might include that the temple to the sun god in uh, Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, displayed the skulls of as many as 60,000 human sacrifices. Now, all of these are historically accurate portrayals of the story of Christopher Columbus, and yet all contain different details told from different angles. But when you can't include everything, you've got to decide what to include. And generally, you decide what to include by taking a look at the reason that you're writing down the story. The first three chapter, chapters of Genesis are no different. While these stories had existed in oral culture for generations, these stories were being written down by Moses as he was about to hand off leadership to the Hebrew, of the Hebrews to Joshua, um, and the Hebrews were about to march into Canaan to take control of it. If you're thinking within Bible history, this is the time of, Deuter of the writing of Deuteronomy, or the, not the writing, the, 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 the occurrences of, of the end of Deuteronomy, beginning of the book of Joshua. That's the time that all of this was actually being written down and codified as, as the Pentateuch. And the number one thing that God wanted his people to recognize and to remember was who he is. Now, at LifePoint, we talk a lot about who God is. The reason we talk about it is because God cares a lot about our recognizing and remembering who he is. When we look at the way that the Old Testament talks about God's people walking away from him, it always begins with a description of idolatry, of not recognizing Yahweh God for who he is, and either worshiping other things or other gods or even themselves. And so throughout the first five books of the Old Testament, we see over and over again God showing us who he is. And we also see that at the root of much of the sin of God's people is a failure to recognize and worship him for who he is. 
Ultimately, this is what we see in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1 tells us, he sa- uh, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that Yahweh God had made. To me, perhaps most, the most striking thing about this introduction isn't what's there, it's what isn't there. At the end of chapter 2, we have God creating the garden, and then God making man, and then God making woman, and then calling it all good. And then in the very next sentence, we have a talking snake trying to mess up all that God's good stuff. And yet we have no semblance of an explanation for uh, what the serpent really is, or where it came from, or why it can talk, or how something so evil came to be in God's good garden. I mean, we don't have any of this explained. The one thing that we do have is actually not in this text at all. It's in the introduction to the book of Job. Now, textual scholars tell us that it's likely that Job, uh, that Job's actually the oldest book of the Bible that we have in terms of what's been written down. Um, uh, They tell us that Job likely had already been written down and formulated into a story even before Moses wrote down the events of the book of Genesis. And so it's likely that the original readers of Genesis 3 would have been familiar with the story of Job. And in the first and second chapters of the story of Job, we see, a, we, see, we see a particular character coming into the presence of God and mocking God's servant Job. And the text simply refers to this character as Hasatan, the adversary. In Job, this character exists to labor against the good work of God and insisting that Job's faithful. How has the serpent changed the wording of God's instructions from chapter 2? Notice what the serpent asks the woman in verse 2. Did God say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? How has the serpent serpent changed the wording of God's instruction from chapter 2? Uh, If you've got your your Bible with us, go back to uh, chapter 2, I believe it's verse 15. Um, And and look, how has has the serpent changed the wording from the way that God delivered it in chapter 2? First, it's God told the man, you may eat freely of any and every tree. The woman hadn't yet been created, and so God's speaking to man and says, you may eat freely of any and every tree in the garden, just not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, God says to his human creation, take advantage of all that I created, at least all of that I created in the way of plant-based food, except for this one, this one little thing over here. And the serpent twists the language to put the emphasis on the fact that God prohibits anything at all. Did God really say that you can't eat any of this? Well, no, I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, we can eat some of it, just, just not that over there. Huh. Interesting. Satan prompts the woman to focus not on what God had provided, but on what he had fenced off. Now look at how the woman responds. Verse 2 says, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. Now, what does the woman do here? She does correct the serpent's factual mistake, but she also adopts much of his language. So, for instance, she loses the um, the emphasis on their being able to to eat freely of all the trees in the garden... Save one. She also identifies the fenced off tree, not by its significance as the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but by its location, as if God had, uh, had not already told them what it was about that tree that would make it problematic. Also, the woman adds a restriction to God's instruction. God, notice God never said that man and woman couldn't touch the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said they shouldn't eat the fruit. He never said they couldn't look at it, never said they couldn't consider it or investigate it or come to their own conclusion that yes, in fact, this does look problematic. What they were prohibited from doing was choosing their own discernment over God's discernment. 
And woman's addition of prohibiting their even touching the fruit, it took God's prohibition from, hey, this is harmful, don't, don't eat this, to just do what I tell you to do and don't ask questions. That's not what God says. Well, all of these, all these are significant. The absolute biggest tactic that the serpent employs is that the serpent shrewdly changes the way that woman thinks and talks about Yahweh God. Notice how God is described in every instance throughout chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. In every instance, the text refers to God as Yahweh Elohim. The, the language in your English Bible is going to say Lord God, Yahweh Elohim in the Hebrew. This is the, the covenant name of God. This is the way that God describes himself when he um, may establishes covenant with his people. The name that set the God of the Hebrews apart from every other deity in the ancient world. But when the serpent comes along, how does he refer to God? He refers to God simply as God. Simply as Elohim. Uh, in English, we would actually put this as a lowercase g, God. Not as the creator God who had called everything into existence. Not as the relationship builder who had walked and talked with man and woman. Uh, not as the great rescuer who, who would one day give his life for man and woman and their descendants. But as some generic, watered-down God. And when we start questioning who God is, then we start filling in the imaginary gaps with our own ideas of who God should be. Or like woman, uh, start, we start attributing other motivations to God. And what we wind up is a shift from focusing on who God is to a focus on asking is God's instruction really reasonable? We know from the end of the story that the serpent goes on to challenge the character and the, motive, and the motives of God directly. And both woman and man also fall victim to the deceit of the serpent. But it all comes from this starting point of falling victim to the lie that Yahweh God is anything other than exactly who he says that he is. And that his motivations are anything other than exactly what he says that they are. There's absolutely nothing wrong with investigating all of that out there. Now, I don't mean trying it out. I mean investigating uh, for ourselves why God calls that death. And allowing that to strengthen our faith. That when God distinguishes something as deadly or toxic, he knows what he's talking about. But that's only helpful to us when we hold up God for who he really is. And even when we don't necessarily see the death in something that he has called death, we still choose to trust him and his wisdom over our own wisdom. What is it that changed when Jesus came? That was the question that we had in the first, in the first section that we said we would refer to. What, what was it? Why did Paul say that God gave us the law as our pedagogos, our guardian, until Christ came? Because Jesus brought with him the Holy Spirit. And having the Holy Spirit within us makes it so that even when we don't know all the right things to stay away from, we need only to seek him. In other words, walking with Jesus isn't about walking away from anything. It's about walking toward Jesus. It's not about worrying so much about our missteps. And I mean, sorry, it's about not worrying so much about our missteps and instead focusing on honoring Yahweh God for who he is. What's the big lie about sex that Satan is telling our singles? It's the same lie that Hasatan told man and woman in Genesis 3. It's that God isn't good enough. What God made for us isn't good enough. At least not on its own. We'd be better off finding out, out for ourselves what our best is. That all of that out there is so much better 
than what God has created for us. That's the lie. That there's anything out there for us better than God himself, than Jesus himself. If that's the lie that Satan is telling you this morning, then I could tell you that all of that out there looks, that looks good, it comes with a price. I could tell you that sex outside of the way that God created for it to be enjoyed always comes with strings attached. I could tell you all that, and that would be true, but in order to tell you those things, I, I would still be encouraging you to place your focus in the wrong place. And so instead, let me just encourage you this morning with the words of Proverbs 34, 8. Taste and see that Yahweh God is good. Taste and see that Jesus is good. Give him a shot. See what kind of abundant life God has to offer you in Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you and we know in our heads that, at least theoretically, you're supposed to be good. But knowing in our heads and trusting with our feet are often very different things. And so, Lord, this morning, that thing that you showed us, that thing that you showed us in the beginning, when we asked you to illuminate something within our hearts, that thing that you showed us, give us the strength this morning to give that to you. And by give that to you, what I really mean is to say, Lord, I'm not going to look for satisfaction here. I'm going to look for satisfaction in you. I'm going to let you fill this hole within me. I'm going to trust that if you are really good, then I don't have to look elsewhere. Give us that courage and that strength and that wisdom this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Please join us again in singing.
Amen. Amen. Uh, we are so, uh, just so grateful um, that the Lord has given us a, um, a worship team and a tech team uh, that we can even do what we're doing right now on a, on a morning um, that's just a little maybe too cold for everybody to come out. Though, I just checked my phone and it's only 30 below outside. Go build a snow fort. Do something fun today. Don't waste your time inside. No, but seriously, uh, seriously, we um, uh, are excited about uh, two, two, we've got two things coming up uh, at the tail end of uh, this series. So next week we'll be looking at um, the lie that Satan tells our married, uh, our married couples, but then the following Wednesday night, we're actually having an event here Wednesday night at 630 called How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex. Now, this is not just for your kids. If you've got grandkids, if you've got neighbor kids, if you're a, a teacher or a Sunday school teacher, and you just never know how to respond when that stuff comes up, um, we're going to have a good time of looking at some, uh, some good overarching principles. And then we're going to do a, like 30, 45 minutes of Q&A. So whatever your very particular question is, Go ahead and send it to us or, uh, or get it ready for that night and, we'll, um, and we'll, we'll do everything that we can to answer all of your questions. The, the following Sunday, we've got our hymn sing uh, here at LifePoint, 2220 Edgerton Street at 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, we're going to have a great time of singing the good old hymns, the good old ways. Um, yeah, it's going to be good. See, I'm, uh, uh, Jane, Jane's been working on that really hard and, uh, uh, and, and it's going to be good. It's going to be really good. Um, whatever you do this week, um, whatever you do this week, be aware of yourself looking for the line. Um, and as you see yourself looking for the line, recognize and remember, regardless of where you think the line is, whether you're still on the okay side of it or have crossed it, just looking for the line itself is an indicator of the fact that I've taken my eyes off Jesus. I can't have my eyes on Jesus and looking for the line. And so when you find yourself looking for the line, stop and put your eyes back on Jesus this week. We love you. Um, stay warm, stay safe, and... Weather and Lord willing, we'll be uh, back here in the building, uh, 22, 20, 10 a.m. next Sunday. See you next week.